Hi everyone. We are gonna break a record and start a panel a few minutes before, before schedule. Um, so we want to take advantage of time and uh, we have uh, reached our third and final panel. So this panel is about domestic measures to bolster NAFTA. Throughout the day, you've heard a lot about what, pol what countries could be doing domestically. Uh, and this panel is precisely about that. In what ways can countries enact domestic policies that might help uh, reduce uh, the losses of trade or distribute the gains more widely? And so uh, it's a pleasure for me to introduce you to Professor and Father Matthew Carnes, who is going to be the chair discussant of this panel. He is a professor in the Department of Government, uh, Government and SFS here at Georgetown. And he's also the director of our Center for Latin American Studies. He uh, works in uh, the areas of labor, uh, social and welfare policy in developing and middle-income countries, and has conducted extensive research in Argentina, Peru, Chile, Chile, Bolivia, and worked on development projects in Honduras, Mexico, Uruguay, Paraguay, and Ecuador. He's the author of Continuity Despite Change, The Politics of Labor Regulation in Latin America, and has published articles in many prestigious journals. Um, he's also the recipient of the SFS Faculty of the Year Award and the University-wide Dorothy Brown Award. So I'll give him now the microphone and he'll introduce the rest of the panelists. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, Alvaro. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be with you today. Um, in some ways, uh, participating in this panel is a culmination of a lot of my uh, own professional life in that uh, I wrote my undergraduate thesis way back when, right as NAFTA was beginning, on the automobile industry in Mexico and some of the issues we've been talking about um, today around domestic sourcing um, and the impacts that NAFTA might have. So it's great now to be able to take this moment to look at the balance of the NAFTA accord, what we've seen between the two countries, Earlier today, you've talked about its impacts. You've talked some um, about the ways that it might be renegotiated. Now, today, we get to, or now at this moment in the, in the discussion, we get to focus in in a particular way on the ways that each domestic uh, uh, audience, domestic government might look at the opportunities and challenges presented, both by NAFTA as it's existed and where things are going as we move forward. Um, so we have a fabulous panel to help uh, comment on that today. So what I'll do first is introduce each of them, and then uh, we'll begin with a question. They'll really ask them to think about um, some of the gains and losses, uh, the, the ways that uh, benefits might be better um, uh, distributed inside the accord. So first to my uh, left, Danny Behar is the David M. Rubenstein Fellow in the Global Economy and Development Program at the Brookings Institution. He's an Israeli and Venezuelan economist. He's also an associate at the Harvard Center for International Development. His research sits at the intersection of international econ economics and economic development. In particular, his academic research focuses on, on structural transformation and productivity dynamics, and how they are affected by such factors as migration, innovation, trade, investment, entrepreneurship, and the diffusion of technology within and across borders. His expertise on policy issues includes international trade, migration, and globalization, and as well as the understanding of economic trends in the global economy and in particular regions. His academic work has been published in top, uh, top economic journals, and he often contributes to leading media outlets in the United States and around the globe. He's worked and consulted for multi multilateral development organizations, the Bank and the American Development Bank. He holds a BA in systems engineering from the Universidad Metropolitana in Caracas an MA in economics from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, an MPA in international development from the Harvard Kennedy School, and a PhD in public policy from Harvard University. So Danny, welcome. Thank you. Celeste Drake is the trade spot policy specialist for the AFL-CIO, where she works to reform US trade policy so that working families globally can enjoy shared prosperity and inclusive growth. She's testified before the Senate Committee on Foreign Relations, the House Ways and Means Subcommittee on Trade, and the International Trade Commission. It made dozens of presentations for diverse audiences, including the European Union's Economic and Social Committee, the WTO Public Forum, the Federation of Tax Administrators, and the Government of Taiwan. Prior to joining the AFL-CIO, she served as Legislative Director for Congresswoman, Congresswoman Linda T. Sanchez, Legislative Counsel for Congressman Lloyd Doggett, 
and clerk for the Honorable David R. Thompson of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. Ms. Drake, who sat on the advisory committee for the U.S. Export-Import Bank from 2012 to 2016, currently serves on the board of Jubilee USA. She has a JD, an MPP, and a BA from the University of California, Los Angeles. Welcome, Celeste. Edward Alden is the Bernard L. Schwartz Senior Fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations in Washington, D.C., and author of the new book, Failure to Adjust, How Americans Got Left Behind in the Global Economy. He was the project director of the Council's Independent Task Force on U.S. Trade and Investment Policy in 2011. He co-chaired, uh, he co-chaired uh, with, uh, by, which was co-chaired by former White House Chief of Staff Andrew Cor Card and the former Senate Majority Leader Thomas Daschle. And prior to joining the Council, Mr. Alden was the Washington Bureau Chief for the Financial Times. He's written extensively about the U.S. response to globalization. He's focused particularly on international trade, immigration, and homeland security. Welcome, Edward. And finally, furthest on my left, Senator Mario Delgado Carrillo is a member of Mexico's left-wing political party, the National Regeneration Mo Movement, Morena. He has a BA from the Technological Autonomous Institute of Mexico, ITAM, and an MA from the University of Essex um, in economics. He's worked in the public sector for over 20 years. From 1997 to 2000, he was technical director for the Budget and Public Account Committee in Congress. He was finance minister for Mexico City from 2006 to 2010 where he famously renegotiated the debt of the city to bolster public investment and, and from 2010 to March 2012 when he was education minister. And he saw school dropout rates decrease by 6%. In 2011, he was distinguished at the World Economic Forum in Davos as a young global leader. And in September 12, 2012, he was elected to, to the Senate where he represents Mexico City constituents until 2018. In the Senate, he heads the Committee on Mexico City and serves as a secretary on Science and Technology Committee and on the Special Committee for Metropolitan Development. He's a member of the Finance, Public Credit, and Commerce, and, uh, Finance, Public Credit, and Commerce Committee and the Industrial Promotion and Security Committees. He's also appointed to accompany the NAFTA renegotiation talks in representation of the Senate. Welcome, Senator uh, Delgado. So as we begin our conversation today, I'd like to invite us to really think about um, some of the gains and losses domestically and how those have been shared uh, um, across the economy. You know, we know that, and especially as our last um, uh, uh, keynote presenter uh, stressed, that the pie may grow as trade increases, but often the, the benefits are not shared just, uh, um, equally across the economy. In fact, there can be some people that are outright losers in, in part of that process. And so the question for us is thinking domestically about each of the countries we represent and the, and the groups that we represent, how might the gains be spread better? How might we think about um, compensating those who have lost in the process of economic integration, especially those who have lost jobs or seen their wages decline? And how might they better participate in the gains? So we'll make our way from my left to um, right, and we'll begin with Danny. Great. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Um, well, I think what, what I want to tell you a little bit is, is um, to, to start setting the stage to really understand the evidence and the facts on these uh, gains and losses, losses that, had, that had happened in the past few years. Mostly, I've been looking at the U.S. I hope uh, some of my colleagues here could complement on the Mexican side. Um, and I think it's really important to get into that evidence and look back, because what we've heard on the U.S. side a lot, and, is, and, and we talked a little bit about that in the previous session, is about the trade deficit. The trade deficit this, the trade deficit that. So it's very easy to look at two points uh, of data. One is that the trade deficit has increased by, by quite a bit on the U.S. side. I'm talking about the bilateral trade deficit between the U.S. and Mexico since NAFTA was established. And at the same time, about um, 5 million jobs in manufacturing were lost in the U.S. Um, and, you know, if you put those two things together without looking at anything else, it could kind of make sense that because of NAFTA, those jobs were lost. But all serious economies, and there are many estimations out there, will actually say that that's not quite the case. There's much more things to look at. All advanced economies in the world, whether they were running a trade deficit or a trade surplus, have been losing jobs in manufacturing. So even if, they, in the case of the United States, even if they lost 5 million jobs in, manufa in the manufacturing sector, the, manufacturing, the output of the manufacturing sector increased by about $800 billion. So the answer suggests, um, or this, this additional point suggests, that the vast majority of jobs that were lost in the U.S. were because of increases in productivity and not because of trade or NAFTA. Now, there are some jobs that were lost because of NAFTA, 
makes sense. There, the U.S. is not competitive in every single good that it uh, exports. No country is. Um, and yeah, there are some uh, uh, areas in the country and some jobs that, that, that were hurt by uh, more competition. Um, the estimates round up say that about 100,000 to 300,000 jobs were lost in the U.S. because of NAFTA, which is a small amount of all the jobs that were lost. Um, and naturally, there's something that has to be done with them because when, when, when you look at the very uh, basic theory of international trade, I'm an economist, um, so I apologize for that, but uh, when you look at the very basic theory of international trade, um, we always talk about the gains from trade. So two countries that are closed, then they open themselves to start training, there's always, a, there's always gains from trade. Both countries are better off on the aggregate. That's what the theory says. But of course, the theory also says that within each country, there are going to be winners and losers. So the, gain, the real gains from trade will come when there, because there is a space for reallocation within each country so that the losers are not going to lose. So we are going to take a share of the pie that the winners are winning and then give it to the losers. And that clearly hasn't happened or didn't happen in the U.S., at least judging by the results of the last elections and by, and by the rhetoric. So I think that there is a lot of space uh, for this administration uh, to really create safety nets uh, for people uh, whose jobs can be really affected by trade or by other things such as automation and, 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 and any other changes that are happening. And that will actually make this administration stand out from all others. Uh, these, kind of, uh, these kind of protections for the workers that, that have lost their jobs or that their wages have, seen, have been hurt is not something that you deal with on the negotiation ta negotiating table with NAFTA. It's, it's, it's purely domestic policy. So I think that that has to really be taken um, into account. And, and one last comment before passing on to, to, to my colleagues is that uh, this is a very difficult conversation because, you know, it's very hard to say. Uh, now we, the U.S. imports a lot of avocado from Mexico, and, you know, that allows U.S. consumers to, you know, buy uh, vegetables and avocados at a, at a lower cost. Uh, and that has increased purchasing power of the American consumer. But it's very hard to say, well, you know, is that better? I mean, is that, does that have to come at a cost that some people have lost their jobs? It's a very difficult comparison. But uh, we do know that this is the process of economic development and economic growth. As countries open and countries develop, some industries lose competitiveness and some other industries arise. And the workers and the machines and the capital that were being used in those low productive, low competitive industries will go to the high productive, high competitive industries. That is the process of structural transformation. That is a process that explains economic growth. When you look at a country like Korea uh, that, has, that had an amazing development story, that's what, they, that's what happened in Korea. They stopped doing, uh, uh, they stopped exporting things that were more agricultural and they moved into services and high end manufacturing goods. I don't think, I mean, that, that was a painful process for some people, but it, has, it was a key process for the economic growth and success of a country like Korea. Uh, and stopping that process will also stop the growth in the United States. I think I'm leaving it up to that for now. Great. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I'm going to push back just on the frame of the question a little bit and say that the, I, I don't agree that all of this has to only do with your domestic policy um, or that you know, somehow uh, the rules of the trade agreements themselves don't, in fact, address distribution issues, be because they do. Um, nor is it the case that just a few people lost their jobs and everybody's benefiting from cheap avocados. That, that's a really oversimplification of what's happening. And studies um, across the board have shown there's a lot of trade loss, job loss due to trade, but the much bigger impact is really the distributive impact and the wage impact. And that takes into it, when you're looking at real wages, you're already taking into account that you're saving money off of the goods because it takes inflation into account. So when we're looking at, oh, there are some isolated job losses here or there, we're really distracting ourselves from the big issue, which is, are we putting international economic rules in place that benefit the already powerful and don't contain in them rules to offset those benefits so that we can have better distribution, more fair distribution, more equality in all of our countries. So it's great to grow the pie, but if you're actually shrinking the slice, 
that's going to working people, which is happening in the United States, in Mexico, in Canada, that's actually not a benefit to working people. So what can we do actually in the rules of the trade agreements to offset that power displacement? And so we should look at the structure of the trade agreements to begin with. In neoliberal trade agreements, they're not really about tariffs. So as much as folks this morning often said, well, it's about free trade or it's about protectionism and you can only have one or the other, there are other models to trade and there are other ways to do the rules to say we're going to promote trade and we're going to promote equitable growth. So why is it that in neoliberal trade agreements, there are rules that mean that countries face potential trade penalties on the basis of the way they regulate their banks or on the basis of their use of fiscal policy to stimulate job growth or on the basis of how they label consumer goods by country of origin or whether or not the tuna is dolphin safe or on the basis of how they promote green energy in homes and the use of solar. All of those things are controlled by trade agreements so they limit domestic policy choices. So what if we think about rather than limiting domestic policy choices, building in commitments into the trade agreement that expand domestic policy choices. So for instance, we suggested that in the NAFTA negotiations, the countries consider working together to make commitments to address tax base erosion and profit shifting. That's something all three countries face and would actually help all three countries if they agreed, well trade incentivizes offshoring, which makes it easier to do base erosion and profit shifting. Let's put some offsetting rules to counteract that balance. We also said, why don't all three countries together put in commitments about how much infrastructure they're going to build? Building infrastructure actually promotes growth these days much faster than free trade agreements, which are cutting a tiny slice off already low tariffs. These are things that benefit everyone because they create immediate jobs and they make the societies more productive in the long term. Those things are still not on the table, but they could be. So the other things that we can do are certainly domestic in nature, but simply saying let's strengthen the safety net when what we see is that neoliberal policy actually promotes cutting down the safety net. As you do more neoliberal globalization, you find that workers are having problems raising their wages and getting more jobs. So the neoliberal answer is always deregulate the labor market, make it easier to fire people, drop the taxes, drop the regulations, and the social safety net is cut. And then workers are again in trouble. And what's the solution? The same thing. So you're supposed to cure a failing labor market by making it even more failing. So there's a lot of things that we can do, but let's not accept the premise that it's only a few people that are hurt or that you can't do anything together through a treaty, through a trade treaty. Please. Yeah, th thanks very much. So, so I noticed there, there are no real Canadians on this panel. So since I grew up in Canada and spent many years, I'll have to be the token Canadian. Um, and, and one of the things that Canadians did well, and they, didn't, they haven't done everything well in their response to trade, but one of the things they did was they had a huge national debate in the 1980s over exactly the sort of questions that we're debating right now about the, the distributional consequences, among other things, of entering into a free trade agreement with a country as large as the United States. These are questions we should have asked a lot of years ago. And, and, and the, the place where I'm going to split the difference is, is I, I agree with Danny. I think most of the failings have been on the domestic front, though they were failings that, you know, this, this was a hurricane we saw a thousand miles away. I mean, economic, economic theory is very clear on this, right? That there are going to be some significant costs. And I agree with Celeste, not just necessarily to individual places, individual pockets of workers, but people are going to be hit in, in the pocketbook more generally. And so we need to think about how we're going to respond to that on the wage side. So we saw that coming from a long way off. But I also think that there are elements of trade rules that we could have done better. And, and I think Donald Trump picked up on a lot of those. Um, Matthew was nice enough to, to mention my book, which, which I'll, I'll promote by saying a new paperback edition just came out a week ago. So, so my book is actually, it's called Failure to Adjust, How Americans Got Left Behind in the Global Economy. And it's actually kind of equally split between the trade rules pieces and the domestic policy pieces. So just a couple of examples. I, I absolutely agree with Celeste 
on the question of sort of corporate subsidies, investment incentives. If you look at the weakest part of the global trade rules, and there's basically nothing in NAFTA that speaks to this, uh, it is efforts to limit uh, government subsidies to corporations in, in various forms. They can be of the sort that the Chinese do to support their state-owned enterprise, and it's why the Chinese produce half the world's steel now, and we've got this huge glut in solar panels because of enormous Chinese government subsidies. They also take the form of tax incentives to attract investment. And the United States is as guilty of this as anyone. Look at the competition going on now for the new Amazon headquarters. Um, these are the sorts of things that actually could be restrained through international cooperation. The Europeans do this. The Europeans have, that's why they're going after Starbucks and Amazon and others for tax evasion. This is something that could have been done through trade agreements. I think currency manipulation, which is an issue not particularly in the NAFTA context, but was a huge issue between the United States and China. This is something that Congress has been worried about for decades. There were rules put in place. They were never enforced. Um, and, and maybe Celeste is just tired of talking about it. But I think the whole question of labor standards, uh, which have, have clearly been, if not inadequate in the writing, which I think they have been certainly inadequately enforced. And, and we saw you know, Harada's very compelling slides this morning about the lack of real wage gains in Mexico. And we can debate whether trade agreements are the best way to get at that problem. I, I don't think we can debate that it is a problem. Um, so those are things I think that all could be addressed on the agreement front. Um, but a lot of the other dimensions really are domestic. I mean, the biggest one is, is the education retraining side. I mean, if you, if you want a, a single explanation as to why the United States became the most successful economy in the world, look at the research of Claudia Golden and Lawrence Katz. We educated more people to a higher level, to high school and beyond, sooner than any other country in the world. That was the source the enormous American advantage in the 1940s, the 1950s, the 1960s. Um, we've stopped doing that. I mean, our educational levels have not declined, but they've kind of flatlined for the last 30 years while the rest of the world is going ahead. Um, we can talk about mid-career retraining, which is very hard, but we knew a lot of people in the manufacturing sector were going to lose their jobs. And we put nothing, and, and trade adjustment assistants have a whole chapter on this. My book is probably less than nothing in place to actually help those people make that transition. And then finally, um, and, and this is a, a project I'm working on now, and Duncan mentioned this morning, I think you know, every think tank in Washington is now, oh my god, we've got to think about future of work. We should have been doing this 20 years ago. But, but one of the big questions is how you actually design a benefit system that supports work the way it's done today. For a variety of historical reasons, um, much of, I hate the phrase social safety net, but I'll use it anyway. Much of the US social safety net is through employment. I mean, corporations are the way people get vacation time, they get retirement benefits, they get their health insurance. Most of our benefits are linked to full-time employment. And full-time employment is declining. More and more workers are working on a contingency basis, a part-time basis. We desperately need to redesign our, our benefit system to, to help people the way they work today and not to tie it to a sort of full-time employment that, that, that is disappearing. So I would say those are the big challenges on the, on the domestic front. Thank I'll you start very much. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Let, let me start saying that I belong to a special commission in, in the Mexican Senate to follow up the negotiation, but doesn't means, that doesn't mean that I know, I know where exactly are the negotiations are. And we don't have, of course, uh, full information because the negotiation now is in the government and the Senate has to approve or not once the negotiation is, is finished. But I'm thinking in different scenarios that we can have. Because even if we analyze economic figures, there is a controversial, there is not a conclusion for the three countries about the benefits of NAFTA. And why we are here? Because the narrative on one political campaign that basically says that the Mexicans are taking the American jobs. So how we're going to evaluate the conclusions under economic uh, analysis or political reasons? Who's going to be the winner? So I think it's going to be very difficult to, after this negotiation, to present results for each country because here in the States, probably the, the main reason of this is to have a, a political victory. So what Trump needs to present this renegotiation as a victory? And what in Mexico 
can accept under that scenario or not. How we can present our, the results of the negotiation as a political victory also. And, and the same in, in, in your country. <coughs> and I, I, I'm worried about that because probably we, in, in the real negotiations, because we have by one side what is happening on the media and the other side what is happening in the real uh, negotiations. And uh, probably what, what we can have at the, at the end is that something in the media or in the political um, uh, discourse that is not in, in reality, that is not matching what, what you're having. So I think it's going to be uh, more difficult because all this uh, noise to have a, a, a conclusion. So let's think about different uh, scenarios. And, and, uh, it, it, and at least at the moment, for the information that we have, the real uh, issues that are more controversial are not even start yet, like automotive, uh, automobile sector, or uh, origins uh, rules. And uh, also the discussion includes, at, at least not officially, but un unofficially, and we are happy with that, about the wa wages in, in Mexico. Also, there's a new uh, table that is going to talk about gender and about corruption, which is also very good news for Mexico, but because at least in the national discussion, uh, the discussion or the debate about the minimum wage has been very close and is a lot of ideological issues around that. And uh, also in the corruption issues, this pressure in, uh, that comes from outside can be, can be very good for us. And at least in Mexico, it's very difficult to have a conclusion uh, about NAFTA benefits because it's very linked to the economic model that we follow after the economic crisis in, in 1982. After the economic crisis in 1982, the Mexican economy started to open. In 90, 1984, Mexico started to join uh, the GATT. And in the, we have a period of hyperinflation in 1987. And then uh, one of the answers or one of the strategies that the government follows to control the inflation was to anchor the inflation with the minimum wage. So since 30 years ago, the minimum wage in Mexico are grows only the inflation rate. So this is the stagnation that, that we have. And uh, the debate, the debate to change that started like uh, five years ago. Uh, Gerardo Esquivel uh, started one of this discussion at national level. And there is a lot of ideolo ideological issues that say, well, uh, the Mexican worker has to increase the productivity because there is no other way to increase the wages. But if you see the numbers, actually the Mexican uh, workers are increasing productivity, but the wages stay in just stuck, just not growing. Uh, so, and uh, actually the, the, uh, the Mexican government said that is one of the advantage, one of the uh, advantage of co competitiveness in Mexico, the, the low wages. And we saw in the morning the graph that uh, Gerardo Esquivel uh, showed us uh, about how the distribution of the capital and labor are in, in, in Mexico. And why the benefits, benefits of NAFTA in Mexico is very difficult to, to sell it, because also the benefits are very concentrated. 50 companies are responsible for the 50% of the manufacturer exports in Mexico. And 87% of the exports are made by companies which more, that have more than 50, employees. So that means that the big companies are the players in this successful ex, uh, export sector in, in, in Mexico. And also, these big companies import uh, the majority of, of the goods, that the, the, the intermediate goods. And the, the imports of intermediate goods are growing, still growing now in Mexican economy. And the added value of the export at 
not uh, growing. Also, I, I would like to see you to show you one uh, map to understand better what is happening also in Mexico in uh, in regional terms. This is this is the country, and the darker is divided by the states, thirty-two states. Is how is growing the country? The the states in the north that are linked to NAFTA are growing in average in the last 10 years around 4%. Then basically the, the, the middle part of the country is growing 2.5% because basically for the, the metropolitan area of Mexico City and then the south is 2%. Also the inequalities of the, of the free trade are very unequal distributed in, in regional uh, levels. So what, what to do in Mexico? What, what we have to do to take advantage of, of free trade and, and NAFTA? No matter the results of the negotiations, I think that we have to, I agree with you, Edward, to invest in human capital. We cannot, we, we cannot uh, still showing the low wages as a great advantage of our economy. Uh, we have to link also the wages to productivity. Uh, we need to set up a very aggressive industrial policy to develop to a, a chain of suppliers and it, that can uh, substitute intermediate goods and link more companies with the export uh, sector in order to have more uh, powerful economic uh, growth. We have to invest also in, in, in innovation. We need a regional strategy of development to reduce the, the gap within the country. And uh, we have also to support the idea of, of one region, just not uh, Mexico against the States or against Canada, is to how we think as a region all the North America. And, uh, and also in, in the last day, the reflection in Mexico is the cancellation of NAFTA is a dead end of Mexico, and probably not. Uh, one of uh, Bloomberg and uh, J.P. Morgan and other uh, uh, analysts are saying that if, if Trump decides to cancel NAFTA, the result is that Mexico has to be under the rules of OMC, with most favored uh, nation, is going to have an impact in the exchange rate. And uh, at the end of the day, this impact in the exchange rate is going to make more competitive the Mexican exports, but of course it's going to have an, an uh, internal impact in the economy. But at least in Mexico, we start to think if what, is, what happened, what can happen, one scenario of Mexico without uh, NAFTA. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you to all of you. This has been really provocative just to start us off. So I think we're going to have a great discussion. Um, and there's lots that we can discuss. Maybe just to highlight a couple things I heard and then point us in a direction. Um, one is, um, I, uh, Senator Delgado, I appreciate at the end or toward the middle of your um, comments, you mentioned the model that's been really followed since about the 1980s to the present. And it really is something of a, a hegemonic model we all kind of grew up in and we all sort of took for granted about the ways that trade agreements can work and should work, um, the uh, supposed gains from trade, right, mutual gains from trade. And it really became something that we always operated inside of. And if anything, this most recent election has thrown that open in some ways. Any way that looked at it carefully before always recognized that there were a multiplicity of things going on underneath the tra uh, trade agreements. But we had this sort of dominant idea that this is, you know, where we were all headed as a world in some ways. And what each country needed to do was think about how it could best fit into that. But the impetus seemed to be towards greater and greater connectivity, greater and greater integration. But now what we're seeing maybe a bit more baldly is that every country is always playing a two-level game, right? A game in which it needs to think about how do I shape international trade agreements? And Celeste, you really highlighted this nicely. How about how can we shape agreements that will be of benefit to all? But at the same time, every country needs to also play to its own domestic uh, uh, market of consumers, its own domestic uh, market of producers. And we know that power is not distributed equally inside that domestic um, system, right? And so we know that there are concentrated um, pockets of people that benefit a lot. 
and actually wide sectors in some, in some cases that have lost out. And so how do we balance those two pieces, especially as we move forward? Because one you know, is saying, renegotiate the trade agreement. Renegotiate in such a way that you know, it's all somehow beneficial to all. We have to recognize that at every moment, we're also negotiating with our own domestic populations. And so bringing those two pieces together and thinking about what the concrete mechanisms are um, could be, I think, very helpful. And you know, Danny, you highlighted some of these in terms of safety nets. Um, Celeste, you talked about some of these in terms of thinking about the wage impact and thinking about what we do both. And I want to really push you all to think both at the domestic level and some at that international level too, because I don't think we can take one without the other. We really need to always be thinking about both. Um, Edward, you listed a, a good number of different uh, pieces that we could think about there in terms of uh, education, um, uh, the future of work. So like each of you highlighted this in some way. So I really wanted to push you thinking about as we move forward, knowing we're in this world that has this a uh, set of trade agreements that especially now have become a little bit more questioned, but some have been aired in more deeply. And, um, but as we're entering that world, how do we respond on two levels, at the domestic level and internationally? Please, Danny. Sure. And feel free to respond to each other, too, because I know you had lots of comments. Yeah, I, I, I want to I wanna go back to a few comments. I, I, I mean, I, I do think that inequality, of course, is, is, is a huge, important issue. I mean, I don't think any serious economist will dismiss it. Um, then the question is like whether, how, to what extent can we say with certainty that trade costs inequality? There is a correlation, but correlation is not a causation. So I'm sure that, I mean, I'm sure that part of it, this is a very difficult question to answer, by the way, and I'm sure that part of it can be attributed to trade, but I don't know how much of it, and I think that that's a question up in there, and I think that we have to be careful of, of, um, of labeling things and, and put them together automatically because uh, uh, even though it's a very hard question, I, I, I'm not sure. I mean, Europe is a much more integrated area than NAFTA and inequality in Europe is not as high as it is in the US or in Mexico. Um, and you can find examples both ways. So I don't know what the real link is, but of sure it's something that it has to be addressed. And, um, uh, but it could, do, it could have to do a lot with with the tax uh, uh, structure of, the, of America. Um, when it comes to trade, of course, it has to do with a lot of the political economy of trade. Big firms, big corporations, they push towards getting lower tariffs in their industries and so on. So, so those things, of course, they have to be, uh, I mean, in, on paper, when you're working on, on, on theory, they don't exist, but they do exist in reality. But it's, to a certain extent, it, it is a domestic issue. I agree that, of course, infrastructure is very important. I don't know how those things would, but 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 um, um, Edward also mentioned the export subsidies or some sort of or some sort of help from states uh, to help firms, which which as of today it's banned by the WTO. I mean, the, the countries cannot, governments cannot uh, subsidize a firm to export. It will be because it seems like an unfair competition. I think that's a, that's a, I mean, <laughs> that's a, I mean, I, 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 sorry, I cannot <laughs> let that go because yeah. It happens everywhere in the world. No, the no, of, co rules, of, of course I mean, it happens. If you're talking about the narrow area of agricultural export subsidies, I agree with you. But if you look okay. writ large, no, I have not my point. I, I, I want to answer, but I'm not my point. My point is <laughs> no. that, I mean, there might be space for that. I don't know. I don't know where the line is because there you're also. I mean, if, if you are thinking about inequality, you're also uh, uh, punishing the poor countries that don't have enough money to subsidize their firms, or you're punishing the small firms that don't have enough cash flow. To uh, dump, to do dumping with the product. So, so if if we care about inequality, I'm not sure that that's the way to go. I'm, I'm not saying I, I don't know where the line is, but we have to be consistent on 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 the kind of policies we want, given the outcomes that we want. Just one last thing about um, uh, um anyway, let me leave it at that, and then I'll come back. If okay. right sure. Um, so I would say you know globalization is not the weather. It doesn't just happen to us. We shape it through the rules, whether it's the IMF, the WTO, NAFTA, all of these other things. And I think Europe is a great example. The reason that they had you know, great statistics on social equality rather than inequality was because of the European model. Social dialogue, very high union density rates, very strong social safety nets, socialism. Over the years, as they have entered into neoliberalism and really gotten rid of a lot of protections for workers, their inequality is growing. And you can look at it, and there is a link. There are studies that show after NAFTA, companies quite clearly told their workers either don't form a union or we'll move to Mexico, or 
take pay cuts and give up seniority rights and give up your health benefits and your retirement benefits and all these things, or we'll move to Mexico. So it was a very specific, let's not have unions technique. It worked. You can look at union density from then to now, and you look at the IMF, which is now saying you need labor unions to have a robust and growing middle class. So the evidence is there. You just have to look at all of the evidence. It's not just a correlation. And, and I like how you emphasize the power aspect. The global corporations have the power to get the international economic rules they want, and they use those rules to suppress worker power, to suppress wages, and it's great for them. So we can talk about all of the things that we want in terms of more job training, more education. Um, we want you know, labor policies that make sure that workers can't be abused and exploited and misclassified and unfairly kept on permatemp contracts, and that we want to have full employment policies that actually recognize that a little inflation can be good, and it's typically the way that workers get raises in the workplace. We can address informality. Um, you know, we can do all these things, but how do we get those policies when we have a situation where our politics and our power to enact those, those policies is so out of whack? It's, it's quite easy to say, let's do another free trade agreement, and then we'll come along later and create um, the social safety net, and we'll come along later and we'll do this. But it doesn't get done because the forces that are trying to say we're pro-labor, we're anti-poverty advocates, we're social justice advocates, can't get those things passed. And the reason you can't get them passed, go up on the Hill, talk to anybody on Ways and Means, and they'll say, we can't do that much because the companies will leave. Oh, we can't do that because the companies will leave. We can't do that because the companies will leave. All the powers with the global companies. So we do really have to talk about these issues of how do we do this, not just theoretically, but practically. Yeah, I mean, I, I, mean, I do think we're getting a sense from this uh, discussion just how difficult and complex these issues are. I, I think the economic evidence is pretty clear that both globalization and technology tend to increase inequality. I mean, I think, it, it, you know, economists talk about skill bias, technological change. People who are sophisticated using technology, who have advanced educations, are doing very well. People without those educations are not doing so well. If you look at it from the perspective of the corporation, you know, both technology and globalization are, in effect, labor substitutes, right? If you're, if you're looking, if you're in a, in a country with fairly high wage rates and you're looking for ways to save money, you can automate, and you know some of your workers are going to lose their jobs, and the rest probably won't see wage increases necessarily. They might, um, or you can offshore some portion portion of your work to to a lower wage economy as as a way of cutting your costs. So I think I think it's pretty clear that the the, the powerful economic forces of our time have tended to increase inequality in places where inequality is not growing so rapidly. In Europe, for the most part, it does much better than we do are places where the policy mechanisms fight against it. I and mean, if you look at where income inequality in, the, in uh, the OECD countries have increased most dramatically, it's in the UK and the United States, where you have, in effect, the weakest labor market policies. This is a particularly hard thing for the United States. And I think part of the reason has to do with our history. The United States has never been a very trade-dependent country. I mean, I started my book by saying I was born into the greatest autarky the world had ever known. You go back to the 1960s, 10% of our economy was tied up in trade. I mean, the, the, the labor unions initially thought expansion trade was going to be a great thing because they had never really faced global competition before. So we have moved over the course of my lifetime into this very different, hyper-competitive world. And, and our institutions, and yeah, I'm pointing at you guys up there, have really not kept pace. Um, I mean, there's a strange way in which Make America Great Again is let's go back to this older, simpler world in which we weren't facing international competition, in which we could be a sort of small government, low regulation, lots of nice small companies. That was the way the economy worked. Well, the economy doesn't work that way anymore. And our institutions really have not caught up to it. And I think a lot of other countries have, have frankly done better. You know, look at the OECD's 2017 employment report. And the United States comes out looking really bad. Uh, on most of the things that have to do with supporting our workforce in a reasonable way. We do much worse than the Europeans, much worse than the Canadians, much worse than most OECD countries. Except Mexico. 
Well, Mexico is, I mean, Mexico is a <laughs> developing economy, and, and there is a difference there, but it is in the OECD, you're right. <laughs> well, I, um, we as a country, we follow completely the script. We open the, the economy, the public finance are on balance, uh, we have independent central bank, uh, we have done a group of structural reforms like a labor reform to make it more easy, more flexible, the labor market, uh, the energy reform, we have low in inflation, and uh, we still without answer for the most mysterious question in the Mexican economy, why we are not growing. And uh, also we have a inequality, uh, how to tackle the, the inequality, because it's growing, and we have 60 million of people in, in, in poverty, and it results in the last uh, 30 years is more inequality and uh, more, 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 po more poverty. And we have done all these sets of, of reform, reform. So I think, I guess that one of the, uh, part of the answer is not, we are not going to have it, uh, to find it in the, in, in the free trade. It's something that we have to do inside. For instance, uh, to stop suppressing the wages, because it's a political decision. It's not an economy decision, it's not something that came from, from the market. It's a political decision that is taken every year. Every day, there's a commission that says the minimum wage in Mexico is gonna be like the, uh, that, that number, just the, the number, increase the number of the inflation the, the year before. So all, all the salaries are, or the wages in the country are determined by, by this, uh, this, the, this ratio. So it's a political decision. And uh, there's a lot of uh, people saying that if you increase more the wages, it's going to, you're gonna have a lot of inflation and it's going to be, very difficult to, to control. And also, if uh, we have to strengthen the, the internal market. Also. But if we, we don't have the, the wages with the growth, there is no way to, to increase the internal market. And another that is not always in the, in the international discussion, that is stop corruption. If we don't stop the corruption, Mexico is going to be very difficult to see the great the rate of growth that we need to create the wealth, the amount of wealth, the economic growth that we need to tackle the poverty and the inequality. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now we'd like to open this up to questions. So if people would like to start coming forward with questions, we'd be happy to start taking those. Um, I'm also happy to throw one more question at you, but let's see if we have anyone who'd like to jump up right away. Great. Please. I have two, if I'm permitted to. One is about labor standards. Um, and it's a question to uh, the, the Mexicans and also um, to, sorry, I don't know your name in the middle. Celeste. Celeste. Um, and it's particularly about the right to collective bargaining and what you think can be actually achieved in the NAFTA negotiations and um, whether it would be a significant improvement. I was just looking up uh, statistics on um, the percentage of the workforce in the United States that is unionized as compared to Canada. Um, and I think that's important because it's not only government policy minimum wage, I was also checking on that with Jennifer. Uh, but minimum wage and labor standards are, are government policy, but, but, but the percentage of workers that are unionized is also very important because unions provide a lot of um, security to their employees and, and will provide higher wages, much higher wages than the minimum, and uh, pensions and all kinds of other benefits, right? So. In Canada, over 30% of the workforce is unionized, and that's actually down from uh, the past. Uh, a high percentage of that is, is the public sector. 
Another statistics I saw was that 27% of the private sector is unionized, but that doesn't correlate with what I read about the public sector. Um, in the United States, it's been going down, and it's, it's only around 10% compared to 30% Canada, and of which 7% is in private sector. Why? Because of right-to-work legislation, all kinds of other pressures that you know about. So that's question number one, whether that would really make a, a big difference, the right to collective bargaining, as Canada has proposed. And, and the same go goes for Mexico, but I didn't look up the statistics. Um, oh, and on minimum wage, Ontario just raised the minimum wage to about 14 or $15 an hour, which uh, in the United States is double the, the, um, the national minimum wage, as I understand it. I, again, I don't know what minimum wages are in, in Mexico, but... Uh, obviously, that has a big impact as as well, and you can believe the union uh, unionized workers make a lot more than that in Canada. Um, secondly, Celeste, you talked about redistribution and and spending powers and and things like that being in trade agreements, and I'm wondering what exactly you have in mind and whether the others agree, because it seems to me that you're dipping into matters relating to tax, government's taxation and spending powers. And up to this point in time, governments have treated those areas as really um, part of their sovereign um, jurisdiction that they just do not do not want to relegate to, to trade agreements. Uh, anything to do with taxation has been exempted. In fact, regulation of the banks has been exempted pretty much and certainly things related to spending power. So I'm wondering um, how and why would you build a consensus around dealing with those matters under trade agreement? Thanks. Do you want me to start? Okay. Um, so, yeah, so great questions. So in terms of the right to collective bargaining, I actually uh, want to read a little bit of the National Labor Relations Act because uh, based on how our government behaves, you wouldn't necessarily know this is the law. It is the declared policy of the United States to encourage the practice and procedure of collective bargaining and to protect the exercise by workers of full freedom of association, self-organization, and designation of representatives of their own choosing for the purpose of negotiating the terms and conditions of their employment or other mutual aid or protection. Certainly, if you look at how the United States government fails to protect workers who are trying to engage in that, you wouldn't know that it is the official government policy to promote collective bargaining. And what has happened over the years, you, you talk about um, dec dec declining union density, and I, it is across all uh, three NAFTA countries, and it's for a variety of reasons. Uh, but I will tell you specifically in the United States, we can trace it to really two things. One is it's not that workers, so we had a peak of union density in the United States uh, in the early 70s, somewhere between 30 and 35 percent. And that was a, not as even close to where Europe is, where Canada was, all of this. But it was enough that non-unionized employers had to up their game to compete uh, for workers with unionized employers. So it really helped all workers, even the non-unionized workers. And it's not as if all of those workers have abandoned their unions and voted to exit unions or anything. The vast majority of lost union members are because of closed workplaces. You know, generally just the closure of factories and the transfer of production. The other thing is that it's harder and harder now to organize new unions because the interpretation of the NLRA has changed over the years. And now employers can engage in all kinds of practices in the workplace that interfere with the worker's choice to join a union or not join a union. So they can force workers to watch anti-union films. They can force workers to attend anti-union lectures. They can actually call you in individually and say, Deborah, you don't want to vote for that nasty union because they think if a union is formed in this workplace, we're going to close and we're going to move production somewhere else. So think about that before you vote. That's a threat. That's intimidation. But under US law, somehow, they play this fictional game where, no, that's a prediction. 
It's not a threat, so it's totally fine for employers to engage in it. So these are problems. So what could we do through NAFTA to sort of encourage the practice of collective bargaining? You could say that this kind of intimidation isn't allowed because it's not allowed under the guidance provided by the International Labor Organization. International Labor Organization would say that kind of behavior is a violation of a fundamental labor right. And it's just an unfortunate, I, we believe, misinterpretation of US law that allows that to happen. So you could do that. And we've actually proposed in the draft labor chapter that we wrote that you do that, that you say this kind of imitate, uh, intimidation is wrong. And what Canada has put on the table addresses this kind of intimidation. So will the US and Mexico kind of be open to that being a rule in NAFTA? We'll have to see. I've met with the labor negotiators from both the US and Canada, and at this point, the Canadians say, we're not looking to pull back on that yet. We know the United States is saying no, they don't want it, but we're gonna keep talking and fighting it out at the table, and even just discussing it is a good thing. In terms of wages, similarly, you know, we heard at lunchtime wages are a sovereign issue. I don't know how much more sovereign they are than copyright laws and patent laws and medicinal pricing laws and banking regulations and all of the other things that are in trade agreements. So if you want to talk about ways that countries can cooperate and mutually agree to impose policies to raise wages, they can do that. Will they? It seems unlikely, but we're talking about it, which is an interesting thing. And I think that that last question about taxation and spending, again, trade agreements already touch on this. In the government procurement chapters, it, countries commit to not using domestic preferences. And that's traditional fiscal policy. That's we need to create jobs, so we're going to spend money on US-made goods or Mexican-made goods or Peruvian-made goods or whatever country we're talking about. And countries agree not to do that. And when you agree to cut tariffs, that is agreeing to cut taxes, because tariffs are taxes. So we're sort of asking countries to push themselves and do, be creative and see what they, what they can agree on. Now, with these three current governments, you know, we don't live in a fantasy world. We don't have a lot of hope that, you know, Trump is going to wake up tomorrow and be a progressive. But why not put these ideas on the table and, and have people talk about them? So, so that's why we're doing it. We think it needs to be part of the discussion. And, and we're hopeful it will change the discussion, even if you know, the outcomes we can't predict at this moment. Well, in Mexico, uh, unions are traditionally linked to the, to the government, uh, to one party, exactly the, the PRI. And not necessarily the unions protect the labor rights of the of the majority of the of the workers. Some of, of the unions are more uh, interested in protecting the the interests of the government instead of the of of the workers. And uh, I don't know exactly the number of uh, workers who are linked to one union. What I can say is the, just fifty percent of uh, of the people in Mexico, the workers are. On their, on their social uh, security, and the rest are informal. In the informal sector, uh, they don't have any social uh, protection. And uh, but also for that sector, the minimum wage is is decisive. To is, is very important to to have a great impact in how to this sector is going to to earn. Um, oh, that's it. Yeah. Please. Well, thank you very much. I, I think I, I'm finding myself feeling like we're here stuck in the middle somewhere of this sort of, to some degree, uh, tough debate um, where on the one hand you have people saying, if a trade agreement, I don't just mean trade, I mean a trade agreement didn't really cause whatever um, the particular problem is, and I would say particularly the inequality problem, you can't expect a new trade agreement to solve it. That's sort of the one argument. And on the other hand, there's those that say, and I think, Celeste, you were really putting this argument out there, wait a minute, a trade agreement is the only train leaving the station. I mean, that's the only legislation that's going to clearly move. You better hook yourself onto it if you want to actually make this change. So it, it just raises for me two questions that I wondered 
wondered if we could debate or, or talk about. I mean, one is the issue of how strong is the train? I mean, is the trade agreement really strong enough? Because the, the concern I have, if, if you think, I mean, David Gantz's question that came up earlier, if the tariffs are already very low and the business community thinks they're getting only a marginal gain uh, by coming under a free trade agreement, is that train strong enough to pull a train that's got a lot of labor or tax or other things on it? And again, I, I don't mean to be one of those people that you can't attach anything to my train, but, but the, a real concern about whether trade policy, even if it wants to, I mean, well, first of all, we got to get to whether it wants to, but if it wants to, can it do that? And then the second thing is, is it really desirable? I mean, there's a concern I've always had uh, that we have this thing, trade adjustment assistance in the United States, where the arguably one of the only places in which you can get actual um, help in terms of retraining yourself for a new job is if you get it through trade adjustment assistance, which means you have to prove that you lost your job to trade. And my question is whether that's actually helpful to make everybody go through, if you will, redoing the whole myth about whether, oh, no, no, you didn't lose your job to trade. You lost it to technology. It's pretty cold comfort to the person that lost their job to tell them, no, 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 we've decided that you didn't lose your job to trade. You lost it to a robot. So no job training for you. Um, I, I'm not sure whether I think this constant linking between trade adjustment assistance and help for retraining is necessarily in the interests of those that think maybe trade agreements are, in the end of the day, still a good idea. And then the last sort of thing on, the, on this sort of debate about whether or not the train can pull this, to me, one of the huge problems and why the United States' is, inequality gap has gotten so much bigger than everybody else is because we are so much different than the whole rest of the world in our tax structure, where we tax labor at 39% and we tax capital at, you know, ostensibly 15 in reality, 9%. So we have this massive gap between how we tax labor and how we tax capital that is not true of anybody else in the world, hence the reason our Gini index is nearing 50. Um, is that something that can be addressed in any way by hooking into trade agreements? Sorry. And to spare the question, let's let everyone respond who'd like to. Do you want to start, uh, Edward? Or Danny, you want to start, and then Edward? Uh, go ahead, Danny. I, I'll, I'll Sorry, I, I just want to uh, take advantage of your answer also to give some more answers that were um, something that I was following up to. So, um, I mean, uh, I think I agree with you, and that, that's the point I was trying to make. I mean, there is an increase in inequality in the U.S., but I, I don't really know what can we attribute it to if it's only trade. I'm not saying that globalization has nothing to do with it. I agree completely with you that, of course, that they're skilled by a technological change. It plays a role. I don't know if it's 10% of it or it's 90% of it. And frankly, I don't think none of us know. And, 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 and I mean, and if, if somebody does know, you should call the Nobel Committee. By Monday, they're going to announce the economics price. Um, so, 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 so that's why I think we have to be careful of these numbers. So, I, 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 if I mean, if if there's something we can do with trade agreements to make in, to lessen inequality, certainly we have to do it. Uh, I just don't know if the focus is there. Um, and 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 one of the things that you're mentioning that the, I look at that program, Edward probably knows much more um, the, the, in his book. I think he writes about that and other things. And the, the trade adjustment assistance. I agree with you. I mean, if you have to go to a place and then put a whole list and convince some bureaucrat that you lost your job to your, you lost your job to trade or not something else, yeah, it's that's not the way it works. It, it shouldn't work like that. If you lost your job for a reason, you should have a good safety net like the Europeans have. So let, let me rephrase how, because I, I feel like I'm representing a part of the spectrum that I'm actually not in, but, but, but uh -huh. um, this is how economies look at the world. Markets usually work. They have failures. There are a bunch of market failures, and when there are market failures, there is space for government to come in and fix them. Mexico has followed the recipe, I agree, and they haven't grown, and that's a big enigma. Why? I don't know if there are more market failures that we have to, to fix. Uh, I, I don't know if, you, if, if, if workers have to be more unionized or not. I don't like to use labels, so I'm not going to use neoliberal or socialist. I, I don't like the labels. But just to keep things in perspective, I'm from Venezuela. <laughs> OK? So they followed another script and look at us now. So, so, so I think that, that we have to keep things in perspective. I do think that trade in general has been positive for the U.S. You were talking about the 60s when, when, when trade was 10%. I mean, the U.S. has grown a lot ever since. I don't know if nobody here wants to go and have the same purchasing power that we had in 1960. I don't think we want to. So, so I think that, that we have to acknowledge that, in general, things uh, 
move us into a, 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 a right direction. And there are market failures in the way that we have to address through policy in terms of labor, in terms of environment, in terms of infrastructure to uh, fix inequality and other things. But, but, but I, I think that uh, making the link and saying, using trade as a scapegoat, that that has been the, the, like the president said, the most terrible, horrible deal that has ever happened here, I think that is wrong. It's plain wrong because there's no evidence that, that points to that. Uh, let me just respond briefly to the train strong enough question. So this is, so start by asking yourself what's wrong with NAFTA, right? So from the perspective of the Trump administration, what's wrong with NAFTA is the United States got screwed, right? You know, Mexico did way better. Even Canada did better. I mean, there were the slides that Troy and all three countries believe that, which I thought were wonderful. But that's their basic analysis. And they've layered all of these nationalist demands on the NAFTA train. I don't think the train's strong enough to su survive that. I think it blows it apart. But let's say you had a different analysis. Let, let's say if your analysis started from Gerardo's slides and said the problem here is the growing gap in returns to capital and labor. And to what extent can we try to use a renegotiated NAFTA to address that problem? Not to solve it, because obviously a, a big deal, you know, a, a, a lot of that problem is going to be solved domestically. But can we use the trade agreement to try to address what we could sort of acknowledge is, is the major failing that we've seen over the last couple of decades, whether we blame it on NAFTA or not. I mean, trade flows have grown enormously. And, uh, and you know, the, the, the law from the NAFTA Secretariat had all this wonderful data on trade flows. That's been a big success. But at the level of wage growth, really in all three countries, that has not been a big success. And I do think there are things you could do through trade agreements that would help that. They wouldn't solve it. If you're, if you're going to layer both the nationalist stuff and the wage stuff, then, of course, the train's going to fall apart uh, completely. So, uh, and then just quickly on, on TA, I, I think everyone would agree that the United States needs comprehensive worker adjustment policies, but we spend a fraction of the money on it that any other advanced economy does. Our spending on these labor market programs is about a fifth of the average in Europe. It's about a 20th of what they spend in Denmark. So, so we just, we've never invested in this seriously as a country. Um, I will associate myself pretty much with everything Edward just said. Um, I would just add, since labor unions are so often linked with TAA, it's really because, again, kind of like you said, we'll go to where the trade agreements, because that's where the action is. TAA is there. You know, it's not great. Workers call it funeral insurance, you know, rather than, you know, a new lease on life that, that gives you new skills for a new job. Uh, but, and we've long said, A, delink it from trade agreement. Why are we always voting on it at the same time we're passing a trade agreement? And it should be comprehensive. And if you look at, you know, the U.S. in the past, employers used to fund a lot more training themselves. They have stopped doing that, just as, the, as they have stopped investing in a lot of things. So all we've got now is the potential for some government training, and the TA is the only program we've got. It's inadequate. We don't love it. We argue to keep it when it's going to die just because there's nothing else. So I, we don't defend it. Um, and the other thing I just want to say, it really is the supreme irony that we're having all these, I think, really useful, uh, vibrant discussions about trade and trade policy because of Trump, who, you know, campaigned on this idea that somehow the U.S. is losing at the expense of, you know, Mexico in particular, as if Mexican workers are, are taking away jobs. And that's not the model. What's happening is, you know, as I tried to explain, it's rules that benefit the largest corporations in each of the three countries, and it's workers in each of the three countries that are paying the price. And we're seeing more inequality and wage suppression uh, and union repression and all of those things in all three countries. So it's got to be an international solution. And when you see the trade flows, and that was what was so interesting, again, we heard at lunchtime, the admission that uh, the U.S. and Mexico have the largest intra-firm trade of any bilateral trade relationship. So it's, we're not sending a lot of goods to the Mexican middle class that's buying everything. Go to a, an auto factory in Mexico, you don't see the workers driving there in the cars, being able to buy the things that they built. It's really intra-firm trade. So what we've got to do is say, how do we grow wages and middle classes in all three countries? And that's a great conversation. It's just not Trump's conversation. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm Nicolas. I'm an LLM student here at Georgetown. I have a question for the for the senator, but if any of the other panelists wants to jump in, 
more than happy. Let's suppose for a minute that NAFTA negotiations are not finished before the Mexican presidential election of next year. Do you foresee any substantial change in the bilateral relation or in the negotiation table if there's a if there's a substantial change in the next sorry in the next president call it Manuel Andres Lopez Obrador or or a president from another like political current than the than the actual one. Thanks. Uh, well, substantial change depends on the winner. <laughs> no, I guess so. <laughs> but uh, I think it depends on the winner are also the in the the state of uh, how the negotiations are uh, at that date. No, because it is difficult to to say you, we can support this or not support this because we we are starting. Now the, the, the negotiations. No, it's and it's not because at least in, in, in our party we are in favor of free trade. No. But what kind of negotiation are going to have as a result in, in this uh, NAFTA uh, rounds? We, we we don't know yet. So it's 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 difficult to figure out what what can happen. No. Of course, we would like that. We, we, to have these discussions like uh, wages and, and, and corruption, because in, in the in the national level, this discussion has been very long, as, as we explained. And uh, at the moment, it's not part of the official negotiation wages. Or I, we start already. Uh, we were informed that one table about corruption was open, which is going to be very very interesting. And. Uh, but it will depend. I mean, it's, it's difficult to figure out what now and to make a lot of, uh, to suppose many things that we don't know yet. Um, a quick question also for Senator Delgado um, on the same line you were talking about. Uh, what do you see <coughs> the Senate coming out of this negotiation as the red lines that the Senate could not accept out of the things that Donald Trump has been um, campaigning on or talking about in this process? Again, if, if you, I mean, we are in the fourth round now, uh, and this, at least for the information that we have from the government, has been very different. The media discussion, political discussion, that what really happened in, 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 the, in the tables, in the real negotiation. There is not not all the time what is happening in the media is what is happening in the real uh, negotiations. And uh, we don't know, at least what the government say, we don't have, a, they don't have a paper saying that we want this. No. So it's, it's difficult to say we, we cannot accept in the Senate this, uh, this red line of this, uh, these issues because we, we don't know if it are true or not at the moment, no? Because, but my initial reflection was that, exactly. How we are going to evaluate the results under political criteria or under economic uh, criteria? And I see that it, it's going to be very difficult to have a conclusion because, for instance, we want to include wages. And if the renegotiation don't tackle these ideas, or probably, the NAFTA is not the way to tackle that issues. Probably one sector of the Mexican uh, society is going to say, well, what is going to happen with the wages? There's no solution for this uh, wages or of corruption, any corruption measure. We, we don't know. So probably we are asking to NAFTA in each country things that uh, are not possible. And uh, we see, we see what happened. No, we, but we can't say now it's, this is the red line because we don't know even if it's true or not. Um, hi, my name is uh, Anshu. I'm a reporter with uh, Inside U.S. Trade. Uh, I wanted to ask sort of a, a similar question. Um, you know, yesterday, for, for Senator Delgado, yesterday I heard, uh, you know, a former U.S. 
trade representatives say that, you know, in the U.S., even if the negotiations are successful, it's, you know, we get a NAFTA 2.0, that he's not sure that it will actually pass the U.S. Congress because the Democrats – um, in their efforts to, you know, attract the white working class are going to be more protectionist. The Republican caucus is split. He's not sure that they can even get an NAFTA through the U.S. Congress. I'm interested in the, on, on the Mexican side, you know, even if the negotiations are successful, do you see any sort of political obstacles in getting a negotiated deal through the Mexican Senate? No, I, I must say that we are having an election on the next uh, July. So if negotiation, if negotiation is going to finish the best scenario, I, I'm, I'm sure that not, but can happen in December. Imagine we're going to receive the agreement in January to the Senate. Everybody's going to be focused on the presidential election. And I guess that no matter what is the result, it's going to be a political issue in the, in the campaign. And it's going to be different uh, interpretation of the results according to the political objectives and uh, I, th I, th I think that it's going to take time to, to be approved at least in, in Mexico. I'm sure that's going to be after the, the election of 2018. Do you think it's possible for both the US and Mexico to get a sort of political victory uh, like you were mentioning? If it's being evaluated under political terms, is it possible for both the U.S. and Mexico to sort of win? I don't think so because the personality of or the character of each president. You no, know, I mean it's difficult to imagine one uh, one uh, script that's saying we all win. At least I feel that uh, I'm probably I'm wrong. At least uh, Mr. Trump needs a victory over Mexico, against Mexico, because what's the, what's, the, what's the script in the campaign? The Mexicans are taking our jobs. So what, what is it, what's, the, what's the final of that story? We are recovering our jobs or, or we are reducing the, the, the trade deficit. But I, I, under political uh, criteria, it's going to be very difficult to have a conclusion about the negotiation, you know, that everybody wins. Can I push that question a little bit forward to the rest of you? I'd love to hear you reflect on that. So if a political victory is one of the goals, um, a domestic political victory is sometimes one of the goals of, of a main negotiator, maybe even on both sides, does that then stand in the way of us being able to find something that will be mutually beneficial to both parties? Or is this actually, or is that a good incentive that's going to get them to work in new ways to find uh, um, uh, agreement? What do you, Edward, you're shaking your I mean, I'm gonna, I'm, I think the politics of this are almost insurmountable. The, the only... The only way I can see is if Donald Trump can do a very clever pivot. Because if you're focused on the trade deficit, the real problem is China. I mean, China's two-thirds of our trade deficit. There are real issues with Chinese compliance in the WTO. There is this case that has been launched. I, I, I don't see it as likely. But if you could pivot to seeing NAFTA renegotiation as part of a way to stand up to China more effectively, to deal with the China challenge to the global trading system, maybe you could create a sort of win-win-win scenario out of it. I think it was very unfortunate that Trump came out of the box and made NAFTA renegotiation the first priority. Because I think even under, even under his own criteria, I mean, if you, certainly if you look at worker displacement, imports from China have been a much bigger problem than imports from Mexico. So there are a lot of ways. If, if he could change the narrative, maybe. I, I don't think that's going to happen, but that's my optimistic. He's got to have an enemy somewhere. And, and, and I think if he could flip it in that way, that, that would you know, have the potential for a more positive outcome. At least in North America. <laughs> Any of the others would like to respond? Uh, you know, I would say in terms of, you know, what's what's the victory in our in the trade relationship with China? I believe just this morning uh, there was a story came out that the decision on whether or not uh, the U.S. is going to treat China as a non-market economy was delayed, and that's not a good sign. And there's there have been long delays in cases, whether it's the you know steel and aluminum two thirty two or you know, what's been going on with solar. And I'm not taking a position on any of that, but it just seems like there are entrenched interests in the administration that don't want to act in any particular way on, on China because there are sticky, there are U.S. named corporations that make a lot of money from the current trade relationship with China. So, 
you know, that's the question. I do think there, there's, you know, a very clear path to a win-win-win scenario for NAFTA, whether that's something that the parties can reach and, and whether, you know, how it would be pitched. I think it would require, you know, the administration to stop scapegoating uh, foreign workers and to say there, there's the problem with the rules is they weren't fairly balanced and we've rebalanced them. And that rebalancing is not going to bring back the past or the 1950s or anything silly like that. But that rebalancing is going to help create jobs and raise wages. And I think that's a winning pitch, whether or not they can get there and, and have that kind of message control. That's a whole other question. Just quickly, I mean, I, I subscribe to everything Edward said. So. Um, if if the the objective of the negotiation politically is the I mean, or at least in the political terms, is the trade deficit, um, it's a lost battle for Trump. So there's no way that the trade deficit, I mean, the bilateral trade deficit with Mexico might might reduce. I mean, if they put tariffs and so on, it's going to change. But then it's going to open trade deficit with another country. The overall trade deficit, it doesn't really respond that much to. I mean, unless you're a closed economy, it, don't, it responds to the relationship between savings and investment in the country. It's really uh, not something that you can control with trade agreements that easily. So, so I see, I'm less optimistic. I think that, that pulling out of NAFTA is a real possibility. That is going to hit the U.S. more than Mexico or anybody else. This question, yes. Hi, my name is Diem, an alumni. Oh, NAFTA was signed by Bill Clinton. Donald Trump was whining against Bill Clinton's wife, and that may be the reason why we're all gathered here today. It had to do with the fact who signed NAFTA. It was, after all, Bill Clinton. And at the time, Trump was running against his wife. It had something to do with no, that. Sorry, just, can I just, because I have, I have looked at Trump's history, but Trump was against NAFTA when it was negotiated. He became part of Ross Perot's reform party, considered running seriously for the nomination to that. This is an old issue for Trump. Trump has been quite consistent on trade going back to the mid-1980s. So I'm sure there's personal stuff between Trump and the Clintons, but I don't think that's the source of his origin to NAFTA. <laughs> Should we go over here? Should we go ahead, please? Um, sure. So um, I, had a, I wanted to follow up and drill down on some of the broad solutions proposed um, and was wondering, you know, there was a lot of talk of a comprehensive worker adjustment program, and I wanted to know what your thoughts were on some key specific components that would be in an ideal comprehensive um, program like that that would that could address both trade and um, productivity like TAA currently does not so can I, I I'm go ahead Celeste and I'll, I'll follow sure yeah, yeah. so I would just say I think you know any training program would actually for us have to be couched in you know what the senator proposed at the beginning which is a comprehensive industrial policy because training and education are fantastic. They can't create jobs. They can get people ready to do well, to get jobs and to do well in those jobs and to be productive in those jobs. But giving somebody some skills doesn't create the person or the company or the entity that's gonna hire them. So you've got to look at, and unfortunately, um, one of our previous USTRs, uh, Ron Kirk said, well, you know, essentially we're not gonna make anything in the US anymore, what we're gonna do is we're gonna invent things. So we're gonna invent medicines, and he was talking about pharma, and, and we're gonna produce entertainment, and that's the economy of the future. And that's, it, it's just absurd to imagine that we're gonna have a nation of 300 million inventors, and we're all gonna live off of royalties. So certainly we have to figure out how to provide services, how to make things. Again, not going back to the past and not saying, well, how can we all become you know, sock knitters or whatever, but looking at, once we invent something, how do we then take advantage continentally across all three countries, creating a, a frame to say, we're going to invent it, and then we're going to make it, and we're going to take advantage and have career ladders and, and really look at the value added, rather than letting other countries that have industrial policies, like China, take advantage of the value added. So we do that, and then I think, you know, in terms of the training question, you know, it's got to be linked to you know, what are the growth areas? What are the needs of the community, the state, the region, the continent? And it's gotta be quality and comprehensive. Right now, there is a lot of junk training out there where students pay a lot for some private certificate that no employer wants. 
So it's it's really it's got to be some serious industrial and training policy. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think this last piece is really important. There's just there's a lot of evidence that certificate programs that are designed in close consultation with industries that are hiring in the communities really do offer a path for people to better wages and better lives. Sort of general training programs have not tended to be very effective. So I think there's tremendous scope for improvement in terms of community college, in terms of direct employer involvement, you know, and actually having them uh, more skin in the game in terms of, 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 you know, committing resources to helping to train the people that they're Going to hire. I think there's huge room for improvement there. I, I'm in favor of direct subsidy schemes sometimes, particularly for older workers. Um, you know, wage insurance, where if somebody has to take a lower wage job, you just top up their wage. I mean, the most we do it right now is two years. I mean, why not do it for the last 10 years of their career? You know, if you're in, if you're in a smaller community where you lose your, your well-paying factory job, the only other jobs that are available locally pay half as much. I think there's a good argument to be made for the government just subsidizing, you know, at least half of the difference or more for the remainder of that individual's working life. I also think we need to think about mobility. Americans used to move a lot for better job opportunities, and it's slowed down for a whole bunch of reasons. And the government does nothing to support it. Like under trade adjustment assistance, you get a $1,500 moving allowance. So try moving you know, from a smaller city in the Midwest to San Francisco to find a job on a $1,500 moving allowance. So, so we really do not do things to help people get to where the job opportunities are. So there, there are a whole host of things we're going to do, uh, we could do. I don't think alone they're going to solve the problem. Celeste's point about job creation is a very important one. Um, but there are, you know, there's 6 million job openings in this country right now. Um, and, and there are real matching problems. There's some interesting stuff going on with LinkedIn and Burning Glass and some of the other tech organizations trying to improve the matching problem. Like a lot of employers um, expect, you know, college educations for jobs that don't require them. Um, there are a lot of ways to try to deal with some of the mismatch problems. So sorry for the long answer, but there are a lot of things that can be done. Very few of which we're doing actually. Golfer, we'll give you the last question. Okay, thank you. So I think one takeaway from this panel, as I see it, is that if we're concerned with the negative effects currently uh, that you've discussed at length, we can look at domestic policies, but there's also uh, an important focus on the international rules and how they affect uh, the, the dynamics in domestic economies. And so here I think that the renegotiation opens an important door to think about how those rules might help push or change domestically. And this question is perhaps more directed to Senator Delgado. So there was a labor law reform in Mexico that was uh, in many ways motivated by the negotiation of TPP that kind of went under the radar and was promoted by independent unions that had been asking for these changes. The Senate in Mexico is actually entitled by law to accompany and require the negotiators to come and, and explain and inform the Senate of what things are, how things are going in terms of the negotiation. I wonder what you think or how things look from where you are in terms of what are the possibilities of actually making these reforms successful and including these labor actors that are not traditionally represented in the corporativist regime. So what can the Senate do to articulate these changes to the current NAFTA renegotiation? So I, I, was, I was remembering in the, the negotiation of that reform and uh, was one of the first in, 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 I think was in 2013. And uh, the government proposed the, the law. It was very similar to the former government did. So the, the PRI and, and PAN, which is the, the right party, were, are very with similar uh, proposals. And we, we opened the discussion to, to unions, to academics, to NGOs, and uh, nobody uh, was supporting the law, the changes in the law. And uh, also invite the, the, the organization of a uh, big corporation in, in, in Mexico. And they, they, were, they were agree with the reform partially. But at one moment we, we, find, we found that only gover the government was in favor of that reform to make more flexible to, to hire workers and, and to fire. 
uh, workers. But what we have seen at, after that reform is that there is no impact on that. And also, the, at that moment, they were saying that the productivity of labor is going to change because that law. And uh, we have figures from OECD and um, I don't know, another probably World Bank. And they show the figures because we don't have a labor productivity because of the law. And after the law change, nothing has changed in, in terms of that indicator. So uh, what is happening in, now in the renegotiations is that labor is in, in, inside agreements. Now it's going to be one chapter officially in, in, the, in the agreement. And that is going to, is, is going to have an impact in the, in the, in the, uh, in, in Mexico because uh, how to solve the controversies. And uh, if we, in the Senate, we, we can invite some actors of the society just to listen and to make one proposals. But I insist that the final negotiations is under the, under the government. And they, they have, they, they, we can't change nothing. I mean, we're going to receive the agreement and that we cannot suggest not a single comma. We cannot change nothing. We have to say, according to the Constitution, yes or, or not. So it's, it's not, uh, there, we don't have a lot of influential to change the, a negotiation or to include different actors with different interests in, if, in each uh, issue. So thank you to our panelists. Thank you, uh, Danny Behar. Thank you, Celeste Briggs. Thank you, Edward Alden. And thank you, Senator Legato, for accompanying us today. This has been a fa fabulous conversation. And I think it's it really engaged the complexity of these issues. So thank you very much for all you brought. <laughs>